Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, by way of an introduction to my area, I'm going to start off by posing a question to you in the style of who wants to be a millionaire. Now, for those of you who don't know this game show, um, contestants get asked a series of questions and they get given for each question four potential answers that they need to um, decide which is the right answer. So with that in mind, imagine you're right at the end of your run, you've got the chance of winning a million dollars or pounds or euros or whatever it is, and this is your question. In which year did Christopher Columbus first reach mainland America? Was it A, 1472, B, 1482, C, 1492, or D, 1502. Now, if you said the answer was 1492, you'd be wrong. The answer was actually 1502. 1492 date, which is obviously the most famous date, was the year that Columbus got to the Americas, but on that trip he only got as far as the Bahamas. The first time he actually reached the mainland was on his fourth voyage ten years later in 1502. So congratulations if you just won a million and commiserations if you've just lost a million. Um, but by way of the bonus question, um, I'm going to ask you another one. Where in America, the, on the mainland, did Columbus first um, reach? Cuba. And this is related to what I'm about to talk about. The answer is Honduras. And there you go, I've done an arrow showing you exactly where um, Columbus first hit the mainland. This is a town called Trujillo. And Columbus was so impressed by the deep waters there and the depths of the water there that he named the land after the depths. And the Spanish for depths is Honduras. And that's where the name comes from. So there you go. Um, El Salvador and Honduras, which are the two that I'm going to get to talk about, are, as Johnny said, often the two most uh, neglected and overlooked countries when people are traveling through the region. Um, and I think that's on one level, a real shame, but it's also a really great opportunity to really get uh, beneath the surface and really kind of see what these two countries have to offer. El Salvador itself um, is the smallest country in the whole of Central America. Honduras is the second largest, but almost the entire um, eastern side of Honduras is very sparsely populated, um, rivers um, and forests. Um, so most of the kind of interaction is around El Salvador and on the western side of Honduras. Now, like Nicaragua and Guatemala, both countries have had their fair share of um, turmoil over recent years. El Salvador, um, during the time that Johnny was there, was in the middle of a civil war. It was a 12-year civil war from 1980 through to 1992. And Honduras, for much of the, 19th, of the 20th century, was almost the archetypal banana republic um, with high levels of corruption and foreign influence. And interestingly, the two countries, El Salvador and Honduras, actually went to war with each other, um, albeit only for five days. And it's quite a famous war. It's often referred to as the, the football war or the soccer war, uh, because there was a football match in, right in the middle of the tension, and there was a fight that broke out during the football match. And as a consequence, there were border closures, there was invasions, there was bombing of each other's airports. Um, and Fortunately, the war only lasted five days, even though the tension did last for quite a long time. I'm very happy to say now that the two countries are much friendlier with each other. And the trip which I'm going to talk you through um, is a two-week trip called The Secrets of Central America, which spends about a week in El Salvador and a week then in Honduras. So it's nicely balanced between the two and effectively taking you from the Pacific right the way over to the Caribbean. So the tour starts in El Salvador's capital, um, San Salvador, which is where you saw that photograph of Johnny. Now, to be honest, San Salvador is probably not going to be your favorite city in the whole of the Americas unless you have very uh, particular tastes. Um, but one of the interesting things there is, um, as a, I suppose a, a difference to all the beautiful colonial churches there, 
Um, this is actually some people's favorite church in the Americas. It was built only in 1971. Um, it's called El Rosario. And from the outside, it doesn't look anything special, but it's been built so that in the early morning and late afternoon, the light through the windows is absolutely stunning and gives you this really beautiful ethereal kind of start for your tour. Uh, but we leave San Salvador quite quickly um, and we head out to um, a bay called Jiquilisco which is actually Central America's largest estuary, which feeds out onto the Pacific. And the main reason for coming here is for the hawksbill turtle. Now, this is actually um, one of the world's most endangered sea turtles. And our main reason for coming here is to team up with these guys at couple. And this is a not-for-profit an organization that are dealing with the preservation and conservation of the turtles um, and we'll spend half a day with them learning about what they do um, seeing what they do to preserve kind of the environment for the turtles both on the beaches and in the water and seeing how they generate funds from visitors in order to continue their projects so they actually operate over nine countries um, in the region but El Salvador is actually one of their main regions for this so it's a really nice special experience from there, uh, we leave the coast and we head up into the mountains. And we're heading to a place called Peraquin. Now, Peraquin during the 1980s was the HQ, was the base of the FMLN. This, as Johnny said, was the left wing guerrilla group that was fighting the military junta. Um, and it's a really interesting place where they built a museum to explain kind of their side um, of the war. And nearby, there's a very moving memorial um, at a place called El Mozote, uh, which tells the story of a massacre of 900 men, women and children in 1981, uh, which is written about for those that are interested in a fantastic book by Mark Danner. Now, if this is all sounding a little bit somber and a little bit heavy, um, it's not, because while Peraquin acknowledges its past, one of the great things about it is the fact that they've moved on. And they now realize that they are based in an absolutely stunning part of the country um, that grows a lot of coffee. And they developed the whole area for ecotourism with walks through beautiful regions, through coffee plantations. And it's a really nice positive story about how people have moved on from the troubles um, to better days. But Peraquid itself is quite um, slick in the way that they've done it. But there's quite a few other communities in the area that are trying to replicate what Peraquin has done. And about six years ago, um, one of our staff here in the UK office, Natalie, who some of you may have met and may know, she actually went out to a place called Nuevo Galcho for three months. And what she was doing here is working with a community of about 100 families that had led from El Salvador during the problems. They'd been refugees in Honduras, but eventually in the early 90s, they felt confident enough to come back to El Salvador because they really wanted to raise their children in their home country of El Salvador, but they had nothing, they were dirt poor. They found some land by the ruins of a hacienda and they started gradually to build up a life for themselves. And they wanted to gradually to, you know, welcome tourism, but they had really no idea what they were doing. So Natalie was part of a project that went out there to work with them to help them work towards that. And just some of the things that she did when she found when she got there was there was huge amounts of plastic and metal and rubbish everywhere. So they worked with them. If you look in the bottom left hand corner, that picture is actually them using plastic bottles that have been discarded. They collected more rubbish, filled them all up and actually used these bottles to form eco bricks um, and what they built was a recycling center, which now once a month they collect recycling from all around the local area and then drive it into San Salvador to sell on to a proper recycling plant and that generates income for the village. And likewise, they were working, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, that was some classes specifically for female education and artistic um, development um, that again, Natalie was working with. And what we do on our tour is we go and have lunch um, with the people of Nuevo Galcho and report back to Natalie on how the project's coming along. And that's just a really nice story just to see how, how that is operating. But when we leave here, as says we have a more traditional stop. Uh, we head out to Suchitoto, which to some extent is probably um, um, El Salvador's kind of most classic um, colonial city. You've got your cobbled streets, you've got your painted houses, and it's a beautiful place. But one of the things also that Suchi Toto has, and which is quite unique to the region, is this. Now, in Spanish, 
This is the Chikilite plant, um, and this was for 300 years one of the most important and biggest exports of the whole region. And we'll see the process that they take the plant and turn it into organic indigo. And it's a really fascinating process and it's a great opportunity um, to see that in action and obviously kind of you know, buy some things and have a go yourself doing that, which is really good fun. Um, we also have lunch there. And I would say El Salvador cuisine is probably not as refined as it is in Nicaragua, um, but what you will have, and this is the, the favorite, perennial favorite in um, El Salvador, are the pupusas. And these are corn-based um, kind of, you know, pate, um, kind of tortillas and inside you'll have local cheese or you'll have refried beans or you'll have meat or various combinations and they are incredibly popular and people can get through absolutely huge um, amounts of them so you'll be kind of loaded with loads of those while we're there. Then we go into kind of El Salvador's volcanic region and here we get a chance to go to Cerro Verde, go for a walk in the um, kind of shadow of the volcano and this is home to some great bird life. You have the emerald um, to connect. You've also got the motmot, -mot, which is the national animal of El Salvador, as shown by the fact that it's there on the stamps. Um, and nearby, you have Hoya de Seren. Now, this is El Salvador's UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, first look, you may look at it and go, hmm, doesn't look particularly impressive but it is an incredible place. And this is known as the Pompeii of the Americas. And this is Mayan, this dates back 1400 years. And why this is unique and why this is protected by UNESCO is elsewhere in um, Central America, you'll find incredible Mayan sites, but what's been preserved have been the big kind of state pyramids and big imperial areas. What happened here is there was a volcanic explosion and the ash preserved this whole region. And what you see here are the actual living quarters. And this place, which was only discovered in the mid 1970s, has given an incredible insight into how actually day-to-day -day Mayans lived. And when you look at the thickness of some of the walls and the sturdiness of some of the structures, the slightly sad thing is the Mayans in 600 AD were living to a higher standard than many poor El Salvadorians live today. Uh, but it's a fascinating place to go and visit. And from nearby, you've got what's known as the Flower Route. And this is really just a collection of beautiful little villages, all with their own kind of food stalls and handicrafts. And it's a really popular place to come at the weekends. Um, and it's as popular with locals as it is with foreigners. And that's pretty much kind of our week in El Salvador. Then we cross the border over into Honduras. And one of the first places we go to is called Macaw Mountain which is, yes, as the name would suggest, a great place to see macaws, um, but it's also more importantly, it's a rescue center um, for birds, exotic birds, which have been sold um, and basically been put in cages. So they're rescued, they're rehabilitated, and ultimately they are then released back into the wild. So it's a really, really good project that we go and visit. And this is on the outskirts of probably Honduras's most famous site, which is Copan. And this is one of the key Mayan sites in the whole of Central America. Um, and it dates back parts of it over 3000 years, even though the bulk of it was from around 600 to 800 AD. Interestingly, it was completely deserted by the time that the Spanish arrived. And they think that this was due to overpopulation and soil erosion, um, which shows that these are not um, aspects which are unique to our times. Uh, but it's a great site. And one of the things that it's got that um, is different from maybe the Tikal that Johnny will talk about in Guatemala with the pyramids or Palenque in uh, Mexico with its um, you know, relief panels are the amazing sculptures that you can see here, just one on the left. The other thing that it's most known for, and again, this is unique to Copan, is the hieroglyphic staircase. Um, where the entire staircase is this um, long Mayan message um, lauding the praises of the rulers of the day. And it's the longest such structure um, in the whole of uh, the Mayan world. Um, and again, this is all UNESCO World Heritage as well. Now, when we leave Copan, we go to nearby Gracias, which is a nice, relatively um, 
infrequently visited colonial town, and it gets the name Gracias, thank you, supposedly from the Spanish explorers, which had come over the mountainous region, because Honduras is very mountainous, and eventually they found a bit of flat land, and apparently they went, oh, gracias, or oh, Dios, thank you for giving us a little bit of flat land that we can rest our legs in. So they founded a city there because it was flat. Um, but the main reason why we go there is to go to a nearby village the next day called El Campo. Now, El Campo is inhabited predominantly by the Lenca tribe. Now, the Lenca are indigenous to Honduras. They're the largest indigenous tribe in Honduras, even though they actually only make up 1% of the population. So it's a really interesting experience to meet with them right up in the hills. And they are famed for their red glazed pottery. So we'll spend some time with them learning how um, they create this pottery. From there, we head further north, the beautiful Lago to Yohoya Lake, the nearby national park and waterfalls, before finally making our way to the Caribbean and the coast at Tella, which is absolutely beautiful, stunning, um, you know, Caribbean style beaches. And this will give us access the next day to go and visit a wonderful national park, um, which is known as Punta Sal, or is also known as the Jeanette Kawas National Park after a Honduran activist, environmental activist, who unfortunately was murdered in the 90s, partly for her efforts to conserve this area um, and to protect it from ambitious developers. And this is a great place to see how the monkeys, to see blue moth butterflies, um, incredibly beautiful. It's also a great place to be introduced to the Garifuna. Now the Garifuna are the descendants of West African slaves and indigenous um, Caribs from St. Vincent in the Caribbean, who basically um, were exiled to this region after a failed uprising against the British. They've got their unique culture, their unique language, clothing, song dance, they've even got their own flag. Um, and you'll find them in various countries throughout the region. So that's a really, really nice additional element to Honduras. And if you've got more time on the group tour, you can extend as many people do onto the Bay Islands, which you can see here just north of the Honduras mainland, not just because they're beautiful beaches, but also because of the history there. Um, again, a British thing. Um, we had pirates in the region. Um, and back in the time, what did we do with a pirate? We made him a sir. Our most famous pirate was Sir Henry Morgan. Um, at his peak, he had controlled about 5,000 men who would conduct raids on the Spanish Empire there. Um, and you won't find vestiges of pirates there. You won't find Spanish treasure, treasure, but what you will find are some beautiful beaches and I suppose a more traditional holiday um, end to a tour with some absolutely world-class diving.